This is Public Broadcasting. I'm your host, Captain Rutledge. Well, folks, special treat for all of you today. Allow me to introduce fellow Arthur fan and PBS show reviewer, the person behind the Arthur and Buster BFFL channel, the host with the most. Please give a warm welcome to Viv. Hello there. As Captain said, my name is Viv, and I use they, them pronouns. Viv is here today to help with this year's Arthur video. What will it be this year? Well... In the past year or so, iceberg charts have been popping up all over the internet. In nature, only a small portion of an iceberg is visible above the surface of the ocean, while its greatest bulk lies beneath the waves. Iceberg charts, in comparison, feature forms of media and their associated subunits. Well-known aspects are at the top of the chart, while more obscure facets feature at the bottom. The lower you go, the more obscure things get. There are iceberg charts for pretty much everything. Star Wars, Spongebob, and yes, even Arthur. So today, we will be exploring the Arthur Iceberg, created by Reddit user Slightly Chaotic. The link to the original iceberg chart is in the description below. So, without further ado, let's get elementary. Ahem. The world of Arthur. Peaceful. Safe. Happy. Carefree. <laughs> Try again. This shuddersome creation is really the scene of dark undertones and widespread controversies. Only a long-time fan of the show could possibly undercover its darkest secrets. How was that? Not bad, but it's my turn now. There were secrets being kept behind the scenes. Vicious secrets. And vicious secrets can only be uncovered by a guy who's been around as long as the show and with the noise to shed light on him. That's me, Captain Rutledge. Private eye walking the broadcasting of the public. Now, what do you think of that? Meh. Nah, I've heard better. Needed more food-based slang. Ah oh, well, can't win them all, I suppose. Now, on to the iceberg. This first layer is pretty self-explanatory, so we'll be going through it very quickly. Jekyll, Jekyll, high, Jekyll, high, high, Jekyll. Brain's song from Arthur's almost live, not real music festival. Essentially, a retelling of Robert Louis Stevenson's strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, with Brain in the central role, reading the book and having strange dreams of his evil alter ego. Several famous guest stars have appeared on Arthur through the years. First was U.S. Children's Poet Laureate Jack Perlutsky, followed up by other well-known folks like Fred Rogers, Larry King, Yo-Yo Ma, and even Adele Dazeem. Let it go, let it go. Oh, are you having cake? A reoccurring line by Mr. Ratburn in Dad's Dessert Dilemma, when he kept crashing situations involving Mr. Reed's baked goods. Arthur, I thought I'd better bring you the spring reading. Oh, are you having cake? Arthur's spin-off series featuring Buster Baxter traveling around North America with his father, Bo, and the band Los Viajeros. The series aired from 2004 to 2008 on PBS Kids Go, followed by a very brief fourth season in 2012. You see, pal, the smiling baby in the sun represents our essential unity with nature. Fascinating. It's well established in the show that both animals and babies can understand each other and partake in intellectual conversations. The main song of Arthur's Almost Live Not Real Music Festival. A reoccurring plot element throughout the early Arthur seasons, during the blizzard, 
DW makes a snowball and keeps it in the freezer as a memory. In DW's snow mystery, the snowball vanishes from the freezer. Naturally, DW kept accusing Arthur of stealing the snowball, but nobody ever truly found out what happened to it. It is heavily implied that the real thieves were aliens. So this is what they need. Ooh, we've got to get the recipe! Imagine spots are a common fixture of Arthur episodes, where characters imagine certain outcomes or fantasize about upcoming events. April 9th. The 10th episode of Season 7 originally aired on November 29th, 2002. The episode was a response to the September 11 terrorist attacks the previous year, and features the students of Lakewood Elementary dealing with the aftermath of a fire in the school. Arthur's big hit was episode 1B of season 4, originally aired October 4th, 1999. Arthur completed a model airplane, but DW destroyed it, thinking it can fly. Enraged, Arthur punched DW, leading to one of the most memeable Arthur moments in TV history. I don't think it's a good idea to show hitting on a kid's show. In the episode Mr. Rapper and the Special Someone, Mr. Rapper marries a chocolate shop owner named Patrick. Spanky was DW's pet parakeet who sadly passed away in So Long Spanky. She eventually moved on from Spanky and took a toad named Toadie as her new pet. The Great McGrady. Originally the first episode of season 13, later reanimated as the second episode of season 24, for reasons we can get into later, the episode sees Mrs. McGrady recovering from cancer and the Lakewood Elementary students reacting to her absence and recovery. The episode was co-written by staff writer Leah Ryan, who passed away after the episode's completion. Out of respect, Mrs. McGrady's name was changed from Sarah to Leah from then onwards. Well, huh. that was a piece of cake. Ha 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 Just the tip of the iceberg. That was weird. Alien sightings are a common occurrence in the series, usually on Buster's end of things. Huh? Now who left that freezer door open? Hidden names. In the original Arthur books, Mark Brown liked to hide names of his children to Olin, Tucker, and Eliza in the illustrations. The TV series followed this practice in a few episodes. Arthur's Missing Pal was a 2006 full-length CGI movie featuring the Arthur series characters that was panned by both critics and audiences upon release. I've looked further into this episode in a separate video, so feel free to check it out for more info. Remember how there are two versions of the Great McGrady? The original episode featured guest star cyclist Lance Armstrong talking to Francine about his own cancer recovery. When Armstrong's history of steroid usage came to light, PBS dropped the episode from further airings. The season 24 remake instead features Francine talking to fictional professional wrestler Slam Wilson about his cancer recovery. Shelley is Binky's real Christian name, named after his great-grandfather who helped save a circus from going under through a strongman routine, then becoming the circus's ringmaster. Carl Good is a friend of George's, first introduced in When Carl Met George. He is diagnosed with Asperger's on the autism spectrum and has a love of trains, jigsaw puzzles, and boxed apple juice. Sugar Time was the infamous cancelled episode of Postcards from Buster, where Buster meets a family from Vermont with lesbian parents. The episode garnered considerable controversy, including from then-Secretary of Education Margaret Spellings, and was pulled from PBS airings, though some PBS stations aired the episode anyways. Following the controversy, then-PBS CEO Pat Mitchell was forced to resign, and was replaced by current PBS CEO Paula Kerger. It would be another 14 years before Arthur would show a same-sex couple again, with Mr. Ratburn and the special someone. Binky Rules 
Episode 6A of Season 3 originally aired on November 23rd, 1998. The episode features Buster and Fern solving a mystery about who has been graffitiing Binky rules around Lakewood Elementary. It turns out to be a radio station promoting a new band. Music in the episode is performed by Finnish band Vartina. Good work, detective. You too, detective. For Arthur's 10th anniversary, a scavenger hunt was put together, with the number 10 being hidden in each episode of the 10th season. Viewers were encouraged to locate at least 10 of the hidden 10s and could submit the results through a form on the Arthur webpage to WGBH for a special prize, including the voice of Buster's voice actor Danny Broshu on their home answering machine. In the episode Binky's Music Madness, Binky listens to a band called Bang on a Can All Stars. And while listening to the music on Arthur's MP3 player, imagines himself flowing among fractals. This clip soon became an internet meme, with all stars replaced with other music. What on earth was that? In DW's backpack mishap, DW winds up with a backpack with Omble written on the outside. Based off the contents of the backpack, she imagines Omble to be a hideous, evil master thief with He'd shop! He can leap about! Look at the bones! In the end, though, it just turns out to be Tommy Tibble's backpack with the writing worn off. Arthur's Nose was the first Arthur book written by Mark Brown in 1976, based off a story he told to one of his children. The book probably is best known for its early depictions of the characters like Arthur and Francine more closely resembling their respective species of animal. For the book's 25th anniversary, Mark Brown added in a timeline of character design changes. In 2016, a large number of internet memes scattered across the net, most notably Arthur's clenched fist from the episode Arthur's Big Hit and DW's comment, that sign can't stop me, I can't read. Several more would be created using other show scenes, which we will get into later on down the list. Green-tailed grebes were a species of marshland birds that once lived in the woods and swamps where Elwood City currently stands. They were thought to be rendered extinct due to deforestation, but in the episode for the birds, Brain and Buster managed to spot one but failed to document it. You Are Arthur was episode 5B of season 5, originally aired October 23, 2000. This episode is a POV version of Arthur preparing for a 3K race, and it is the only POV-style episode of the entire series. Lydia first appeared in the episode The Wheel Deal as a paraplegic girl who teaches Brain how to play wheelchair basketball. The character was created by 11-year-old Connor Gordon for the 2009 All Kids Can Character Search Contest and continued to make appearances on the show in the 21st season. On a side note, I actually entered this contest, but my picture is unavailable at the moment. Dang you, postal service! Not really, that's just a joke. Graphic Blood. This most likely refers to the episode Vomitrocious where George suffers from frequent nosebleeds. The blood is perfectly visible to the viewers, but I myself wouldn't consider it graphic in any way. Martin Spivak first appeared in Bitsy's Breakup, in Buster's imagination as his mother's overly boring new boyfriend. The character would later have a larger role as host of the factoid front in the episode Buster Isn't Buying It, though his show was later cancelled due to half-truths and bad science. Probably means it will be picked up by the History Channel very soon. A grass suggested that the Watchers were, in fact, visitors from another planet who built the megalithic platform at Volbeck as a launch pad. Now comes the part where we throw our heads back and laugh. Ready? Ready! <laughs> In the episode Paradise Lost, an imagination scene shows a teenaged version of Baby Kate with an elderly pal. The episode Mr. Radburn and the Special Someone was banned from airing on Alabama Public Television. 
However, the First United Methodist Church of Birmingham later obtained the permission of WGBH Boston to screen the episode during a wedding party. There's also a Twitter account dedicated to airing the episode on Alabama PBS. Sure, the characters don't visibly change much in the show, but the technology sure as heck does. For example, early season Muffy uses a cell phone with an aerial. Mid-season Muffy uses a flip phone. Late-season Muffy uses a smartphone, etc. The same can be seen with other technology, like TV sets, computers, and even cars, and emojis. Arster Buther is an imaginary language somewhat similar to Pig Latin, debuting in Do You Speak George? Arthur can explain it. The last letter of a word and put it in front. If you wind up with two consonants together, put an I sound between them, so radio becomes a radio. Species confusion. Some people confuse Arthur for other animals besides an bark. I'd like to know how a mouse has a pet dog. Andy's not a mouse, he's a... something. I forget. 5,000 Explosions and a Supernova is a movie that plays at the Mill Creek 8 Cinema. Not much is known about the plot, but it's apparently too talky and features some science. Perhaps it's a documentary, or maybe it's an eerie prediction about the career of Michael Bay. Imagination.wav. This is the sound effect used during the character imagination spots. <laughs> that was scary. In Arthur's birthday, when D.W. asks how square balloons are made, the shop clerk jokingly replies, Blow square breaths. I don't know, this does seem familiar somehow. Now you're getting it. Comic Creator. This is a game on the Arthur website, which allowed kids to create their very own comics using Arthur characters. The game was eventually taken down due to a number of probable causes. Copyright and pretty raunchy, crude comic strips created by teenagers with nothing better to do. Alice is the middle name for both Muffy and Francine. It's also an, in an old song called Alice Blue Gown. Coincidence? I think not! Pizza Paula's Pizza Land. This is a pizza-based theme park only seen in Sleep no more. Apparently made entirely out of food. It is never seen again. And I'm not surprised. My guess is probably heightened food risks of food poisoning after two weeks. Not to mention the smell. And the bugs. The location of Elwood City is somewhat of a mystery, though most signs point to it being near Erie, Pennsylvania, Mark Brown's hometown. Other clues point to it being in southern Ontario. This is America, Arthur. Everybody's supposed to get an equal chance. In the episode The Contest, Arthur and his friends compete in a story contest and share their story ideas with each other. The stories are mostly told through parodies of adult cartoons. Buster's story is in the style of South Park, Muffy's is Beavis and Butthead, Brains is Dexter's Laboratory, Francine's and Binky's is WWE, and Arthur's is Dr. Cass' Professional Therapist. Ow! Hey! You squished Buster! Hey, come out! Richism. In the episode, Spoiled Rotten, Francine calls out Muffy for being completely spoiled after donating defected discount clothing for a clothing drive. In response, Muffy accuses Francine of being richest. A what? A richest! Someone who's prejudiced against rich people! Throughout the show, Arthur and his friends are always students in Mr. Ratburn's third grade class. However, in the last day, the class moves on to fourth grade, with Mr. Ratburn becoming their fourth grade teacher, and the former third grade post filled by new teacher, M.C. We finally see the characters in fourth grade during the 2021 special, Arthur's First Day. In the episode, In My Africa, D.W. makes a song about the countries of Africa. But the nation of South Sudan is missing. 
South Sudan was established as a country in June of 2011, over a month after the episode's first airing in the United States, but before the airings in Canada and the UK. What scared Sue Allen? Episode 12A of season three, first airing December 29th, 1998. In the episode. Sue Ellen is frightened by strange noises in the forest and thinks it to be a monster similar to Baba Yaga, a kappa, or even a banshee. Hey, that hurt! In the end, though, it turns out to be Ms. Wood's dog Perky, aka the mother of Arthur's dog. Tommy and Timmy Tibble live with their grandmother in Elwood City, but we never see their parents. Their mother, Trixie Tibble, is a world traveler, having visited South America, France, China, and Las Vegas. Their father is never mentioned, and it may be assumed that he passed away, leaving Mrs. Tibble as the twins' main guardian while Trixie does her traveling. And Prunella gets it twice. A dream sequence reveals a ghost similar in looks to Binky. Named the Ghost of Lunch Tomorrow, he is able to predict what people will have for lunch on a given day. I wonder what's for lunch tomorrow. Tuna noodle casserole. And Arthur changes gears. He changes his name and job to become the Ghost of Bicycles Never Ridden. Bicycles Never Ridden? Boy, you pick the most obvious name you can, and people still don't get it. In Buster the Myth Maker. Buster reads an online celebrity gossip page claiming the star of Snowboard Patrol, Kieran Moody, has six fingers on each hand. However, Arthur and Buster are unable to confirm the myth due to the actor's ski gloves. Friday, thirteenth, episode ten B of season six, first airing November twenty-six, two thousand and one. The episode has Brain trying to disprove superstition. But ends up believing himself cursed with bad luck. It was also the last episode to have Steven Crowder voicing the brain. If you can't beat him, join us. Maria Pappas is a student in Mr. Rathburn's third grade class. For most of the show, she was just a background character. However, she finally had a proper speaking role in the episode Maria Speaks, where it's revealed she has a stutter. But with help from Mr. Rathburn, who also suffered with a stutter as a child. She slowly overcomes her stutter. In Arthur's New Year's Eve, Prunella stays up with her family until midnight when a green flash is visible outside Elwood City. Green flashes are a real phenomenon, usually caused by the sun setting over the ocean. However, they have very little to do with New Year. Wow! I'd like to see that green flash. Occasionally in Arthur, we see interspecies relationships, like with Mr. Ratburn and Patrick. Or that one dream sequence where Arthur and Francine are married as adults. It's nightmares like that that make me never want to grow up. Arthur's lucky pencil, episode two B of season two, first aired on October twenty first, nineteen ninety seven. In this episode, Arthur suffers from a streak of bad luck until he finds a pencil in the street. After which, his luck takes a turn for the better. He passes a test, gets extra Boston cream pie at lunch. However, the pencil starts to shrink down over time, until Arthur finally loses it. In the end, though, he finds he never really needed a lucky pencil after passing a history test without it. The lucky pencil showed up in later episodes. Sue Ellen gets her goose cooked, and the one with D.W.'s ear operation. We never really learn why Bo and Bitsy Baxter divorced in the show. It can be assumed that Bo's career as an airline pilot put a strain on their marriage, seeing how both are seemingly still on good terms, and Bo is still allowed visitation rights and occasional custody. Throughout the early episodes. Arthur and his classmates have often wondered about Mr. Rathburn's true identity. Oftentimes, they view him as a vampire with mind control powers, heck bent on transforming them into homework-loving slaves. Naturally, this is in their heads. He's a really nice guy once you get to know him. In Arthur vs. the Very Mean Crossing Guard, 
Arthur and the Brain meet a new crossing guard named Ted, who charges them $10 to cross the street on the way to school. Ted also warns them about his goons and sending both of them to prison if they make one wrong step. In the end, though, Grandma Thor reveals Ted to be an okay guy, and he apologizes to both Arthur and Brain for causing them any worry. And Sue Ellen gets her goose cooked. Arthur and his friends compete against a user named Forehand451 on virtualgoose.com, but always lose. At least until DW defeats the user. The end of the episode reveals Forehand451 to be DW's friend Emily and her French nanny, Marie Helen. He Does It For Free is one of several memes spread across the 4chan forum site. The freelance moderators of the site were often known as janitors, and were re represented by pictures of Mr. Morris, the school janitor at Lakewood Elementary. Soon, users began memeing the heck out of the janitors, using Mr. Morris as a stand-in and the caption, He Does It For Free. During Prunella's ninth and a half birthday in Miss Fortune Teller, Prunella's older sister Rebella makes her a paper fortune teller called a cootie catcher. Ask a question about the future, and the cootie catcher gives you a fortune. Starts out as good fun, but then the cootie catcher's fortune telling becomes startlingly accurate. Questioning the cootie catcher results in disastrous consequences. By the end of the episode, Arthur and his friends break the cootie catcher's curse. Or did they? During the episode, The Bright Stuff, it is shown that the old castle manor is indeed haunted by a family of ghosts. A father, a mother, and a daughter. Based off the ghost family's clothing, they are all likely passed away before 1930. How did they die? Could it have been Spanish flu? Maybe murder? Nobody really knows. Check out my personal theory for their history and death here. Steven Crowder was the voice actor for Brain between 2000 and 2001. Today he is better known as a conservative political commentator and comedian, and host of the YouTube series Louder with Crowder. In his political discourse, Crowder is known for using racist, sexist, and homophobic rhetoric, and was demonetized twice on YouTube for a pattern of egregious actions that harmed the broader community, and also for violating the YouTube presidential election integrity policy. In short, quite a career shift. It's ridiculous. It's bonkers. You're being given a free pass as a crappy writer because you're gay. Hello, darkness, my old friend. In the Great Sock Mystery, Pal and Kate discover an underground organization that involves pets buying and trading socks to stimulate the economy. This sock exchange is somewhat of an explanation for why human socks keep disappearing. The sock exchange would reappear in the episode The Great Lint Rush. In the episode Bleep, when DW goes to Arthur to ask what a swear word means, we see him working on a second model, the Bell X1 from Arthur's big hit. As soon as DW mentions a swear word, Arthur drops the model and obliterates it for a second time. Thankfully with no hitting on a kid's show. During a flashback scene in Arthur's substitute teacher trouble, Arthur and Buster are in a class taught by substitute teacher Miss Tremolo. Miss Tremolo mumbled so much her students could not understand her. Arthur and Buster have this exchange. What did she say? I don't know. Your ears are bigger than mine. Does this mean if you are a certain species in Arthur, you have a certain improved abilities? This fan theory states that the children's TV show Love Ducks is a method of government brainwashing, as evidenced by how Arthur and his friends are completely hooked on the show and even buy some of their music. Do we have any copies of the Love Duck CD? I like it! Vertine is a Finnish folk music group whose music has been featured on Arthur for Binky Rules and Meet Binky. Their hit song, Matali Yamusti, was used in both episodes. What is a song about, you ask? Well, the English lyrics translation is about teens getting drunk at a party. Definitely suitable for a kid's show. In Muffy's Art Attack, Muffy and her family's butler, Bailey, put together an art show at the Crosswire House. Bailey creates most of the sculptures on display. 
including a sculpture with a horn, a sculpture named Chester, and a giant worm sculpture. The episode's guest star, sculptor Arthur Ganson, is very impressed with all Bailey's work. Mr. Ratburn was not. I don't like this one. It's too sinister. Philistine. Sue Ellen's diary was first introduced in Sue Ellen's Lost Diary. It is highly confidential and only Sue Ellen knows what's written inside. On April 9th, the diary was destroyed in the Lakewood Elementary Fire, but Sue Ellen was given a new diary by Muffy, and a fragment of the old diary was discovered to have survived the fire. It's still private. Well, that's good. You might have been embarrassed. I said some pretty nice things about you. Sometimes in the show, we see characters at future points in their lives. Like Brain winning a Nobel Prize, Buster chatting with his grandchildren, and even Arthur and Francine living together, supposedly at a retirement home. In the special, DW and the Beastly Birthday, Arthur gets transported forward in time to see a nine-year-old DW and four-year-old Kate. In the series finale, All Grown Up, we see grown-up versions of Arthur and his friends in the final moments of the episode at the Sugar Bowl. George is depicted as a moose with very noticeable antlers. They're often disadvantageous, especially when they knock things over or get caught in his locker. During the holidays, however, he usually hangs Christmas tree baubles from them. Curse of the Greeps. Episode 6A of Season 10, first airing May 22nd, 2006, features the Elwood City Greeps baseball team going against Crown City to win their first baseball championship since 1918. Three new players had recently joined the Greeps, namely Playman, Winlan, and Batteria, voiced respectedly by Boston Red Sox players Johnny Damon, Mike Timlin, and Edgar Renteria. In the episode, the Greebs are cursed, in a similar way as the Boston Red Sox curse of the Bambino, where the Bambino curse involved Babe Ruth being sold to the Yankees. The curse of the kid involved Greebs owner Horace P. Crane forcibly taking back a home run baseball from a young boy. In anger, the boy spat on the ball and curse the Greaves to never win another championship. In the episode, though, the curse is lifted as Buster helps the Greaves with their first championship in years. Oh, we're the world champions, and it only took 87 years. How many tears did we just go through? Um, three. Excellent. And how many left? Three. Yes, I know that, but how many left? <sighs> We're in the middle of the list, Captain. Only the middle? But we've been at it for a... Uh, let me check here. Quite a long time. Well, I suppose we could make this a two-parter and continue the iceberg later? Hmm. I don't know. It would mean you wouldn't have to do an extra video this month. You had me an extra video. Thanks for watching, folks, and stay tuned for part two. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share, and also leave a comment below. And also, don't forget to check out Viv's channel, Arthur and Buster BFFL, for more of their great PBS Kids-related content. Until next time, I'm Captain Rutledge. And I'm Viv. Good, Good day. day. Thanks for tuning in, folks. And I say, hey, what a wonderful kind of day If you can learn to work and play And get along with each other You got to listen to your heart Listen to the beat Listen to the rhythm The rhythm of the street It's a simple message And it comes from the heart Believe in yourself For that's the place to start Yeah.